Good evening and welcome to the Skudik Institute. How many folks are first time visitors to the Institute? Wow. How many of how many folks are photographers? So that gives you guys an idea. All right, well the, the Skudik Institute is um, its mission is the advancement of ecosystem science for people of all ages. Um, along with its unique partnership with Acadia National Park. So it is a nonprofit, a 501c3, that works exclusively with the, with the park in that partnership and has um, academic partners and other partners around the state and around the world. For instance, we have a citizen science association that spans nearly every continent of the globe. Tonight, um, we're happy to uh, have a presentation in partnership with the main media workshops and college by our two guests. And so the format this evening will be that um, Nate, who's here on the left, will go first for about 25 minutes, half hour or so, and then Jim will be second. Um, so we're, we're going to attempt to have a presentation then with some questions after the first one. So no one's allowed to leave, you have to stick. And then Jim will um, give his presentation and we'll have a chance for um, questions and answers for the whole, for the whole shebang after that. Um, before I introduce the speakers and while some other folks are walking in, I wanna say that tomorrow at noon we'll have a brown bag lunch right here in the auditorium with a former uh, field technician that worked here last year. Um, she will be presenting on her work with Massachusetts Audubon and it'll be a um, mostly a bird oriented program. So uh, you won't want to miss that. I should introduce myself. I'm Seth Benz. I'm the director of bird, e the bird ecology program here. And just curious, um, the last four days, we've seen nothing but thick fog. And, but every time there was a little window of opportunity, we, we have monitors out at Scudic Point and on top of Cadillac Mountain. And every time there was the little inkling of, of clearing, we were seeing birds pass. And along our auto loop, we're seeing northern flickers. Those are sort of robin-sized brown birds with a white cotton tail. And um, they're all over the place. And also dragonflies are moving through. So green darner dragonflies are actually migrant dragonflies. And today there were hundreds and hundreds of them as soon as the sun came out. So it's an exciting time out here and in the area. For instance, on Monday morning, we saw a sandhill crane on the first tee of the grindstone neck golf course. Who'd have thunk that? We saw a wimbrel on Scudic Point. Now that's a shorebird that's traveling from um, the Arctic where it breeds, and then it comes down this way and feeds in the blueberry barrens before it heads on down to South America on its migration. So to see one, especially in the fog out on Scudic Point, is a pretty special thing. We're seeing peregrine falcons, merlins, all kinds of birds are moving, and the point of all of this is to encourage you to get out to look for things. And migration has everything to do with tonight's topic. Because we're going to fo focus on the night sky, Acadia's night sky. And of course, birds navigate by, by the stars and also by a magnetic compass that they have in their heads lined up with the Earth's magnetic field. So for all of us, it's a pretty special topic and it relates, has everything to do with our mission of ecosystem science, but we bring in art. And so tonight, I'm going to introduce first Nate Levesque, who is a freelance photographer based out of Hamden, Maine. 
which is over towards Bangor. And over the last five years, he has focused his time and energy on capturing the night sky from the coast of Maine. His images have been featured in Astronomy Magazine and National Geographic Travel Magazine. And his, his work on the night sky has won contests with Canon and the National Parks Foundation, as well as the Acadia Night Sky Festival. So this program tonight is a precursor to the Acadia Night Sky Festival, which kicks off with keynotes tomorrow night on the Big Island. But tonight, here, for you all assembled, we're happy to introduce first Nate Levesque, and uh, we'll introduce Jim um, when his turn is up. So please welcome Nate. All right, can everyone hear me? All right. Uh, just grab something real quick. All right, so who am I? So I'm that, that man up there on the, on the left. I currently, I actually just moved to Portland. Um, I was born and raised in Bangor and spent most of my time in Hamden. Um, when I was about 20, 21 years old, I, you would think that I would have spent a lot of time in the park since I lived so close most of my life, but that wasn't the case. Um, when I was about 20 years old, I got this feeling on a boring weekend that I just wanted to go to the park and just go hiking. So jumped in the car without having been there in years and years since I was a child and just went out, found a hike, I think it was Beehive, and just hiked to the top, hiked out, and then drove home that day. And within that brief period, I was completely taken back with the beauty of Acadia National Park. So I kept on doing this every weekend after that, and I finally decided that, you know, I really wanted to share the things that I was seeing in this park. I wanted to capture the beauty of the park and be able to share this with people on Facebook and Instagram and things like that, and even just my family members and friends. So I decided to purchase my first camera. And um, after I purchased that, the following year, I was spent in Acadia National Park, continuing the trend of spending most weekends down here, teaching myself photography through trial and error. And a lot of the pictures that were taken within that time are on a hard drive somewhere, and they will never see the light of day. Um, so after doing that for about a year, and feeling like I had a firm understanding of photography, um, I, was looking at the, I was looking at the main photography show, which had just put out a press release. And the press release was for, I believe, 2012 or 2013. Um, they had announced who the winner was of the Maine Photography Show. And this was a photographer based out of Portland, Maine. His name is Mo Chen. I'm not sure if any of you have heard of him. And it was one of the most beautiful images I had seen. Um, it was a picture of the Milky Way rising over Sand Beach. And the detail that he captured in the sky and in the foreground, and just all of the elements just came together for just a stunning image that I just spent 10 to 15 minutes just staring into. And as I mentioned before, I didn't spend much time at Kagan National Park as a child, and certainly never spent time at night. So I decided that the next weekend I was going to get in my car, I was going to drive to Kagan National Park with my camera, and I was going to see this with my own eyes. So I did that, loaded up the car, and the one about one hour drive, depending on how traffic is, and um, ended up at the parking area beyond Gore Mountain. And once I got there, there was one, there was a few things that I didn't really take into consideration on my trip there. On the trip there, I was very excited to see this. I was just picturing, I just had this image in my mind just going over and over again. But when I got there and I turned off the car and I turned off the lights, it was dark. It was really dark. Um, as someone that grew up in Hamden, we could see the Milky Way very occasionally, but I never really was out in the woods in the dark by myself. So I sat in the car for about 15 minutes thinking like, making up these small excuses in my mind, like, oh, you know, oh it doesn't look that great, like, maybe I should just go back, like, you know, maybe I should. But then I thought, you know, I drove all the way out here, the excitement brought me here, let me step out of the car and let me just see what it's about. As I opened the door, you know, the waves were not comparable to what we have today, but the ocean was just roaring, and I ended up going out on the rocks and just sat there for about 45 minutes to an hour and just clicking the shutter every once in a while while pretty much being lost in the night sky myself. 
again, um, the images that were taken that night will never see the light of day. Um, they, were, they were not great. Um, but what that taught me um, in that moment um, was that, number one, I could conquer the fear of the dark. Second, I saw what I came to see. And third, that I had a long way to go. I had a lot of things to learn. I had a lot of questions. So when I went back home, I um, decided that you know, there was a lot of research that had to be done, and I continued down that path. Um, so there are a few things that I do want to go over. Um, and actually, real quick before I continue, um, that moment really solidified my love of Acadia National Park. Um, from, after, from that moment, most, I would say, 75% of my visits to the park were once the park had closed. Um, five years ago, there were not that many people that were in the park after dark. Um, now we are starting to see more and more people that are coming here because of the Night Sky Festival um, has drawn people up here in popularity. And it's amazing that so many people are coming up here to see this gift that we have. Um, so if you are planning to go out uh, to take a few pictures of the night sky, I do have a few tips for you. So there's a few things that you need to think about before you go out. One of them, obviously, is the Milky Way. If that's what you're going out for, um, you need to know the position, which is something we'll go over in a second. You need to think of the moon. You need to think of light pollution, and you need to think of weather. So what we'll do is we'll get into the Milky Way. So when's the best time to photograph? So given that the Milky Way is out, which the galactic center is typically out between February and late October, early November, um, which is the most, the brightest part of the Milky Way and the most photogenic, um, there are a few different times that you have to wait for to capture it. So when the sun is above the horizon, that is daytime. When it's six degrees below horizon, it's what we call civil twilight, 12 degrees nautical twilight, 18 degrees astronomical twilight, and then anything beyond that is just deemed night. Um, so there are a bunch of apps out there that allow you to see exactly where the Milky Way is going to be on any given day and pretty much any given year. Um, it's a very, uh, believe it or not, something that is uh, it's very steady. It's, uh, <laughs> it keeps a very good, uh, um, it stays on, on track, on pattern. So um, as you can see here, this is uh, an example of taking a picture when it was not deemed night. I believe this was taken at nautical twilight. So you're still seeing a lot of the light from the sun is still affecting, but you're starting to see a bit of the galactic center coming out of the Milky Way there. Um, so moon phases, another thing that you need to take into consideration. So what is, when is your best time to shoot? So a bright moon, if you're going out to not only capture the Milky Way, but you're going out to capture a foreground element as well, um, a very bright moon will expose your foreground, but it will reduce the number of stars that you're going to see in your image. However, no moon can make your foreground very dark, and you would have to do a composition um, with a very lengthy exposure if you wanted to get anything from your foreground. Um, this here's a picture of me. Um, pretty much what I did was I hit the 10 second timer and I ran around and <laughs> stood there. And this is actually when the moon is still out. And I believe this was a, a quarter moon last year during the meteor shower. So I was up there waiting for the meteor shower to take place and uh, had a little bit of time to kill. So I got there a bit early to, to make sure that everything was all right. And as you can see, the darkness kind of coming down to light um, of the moon. So weather, as I like to call it, the destroyer of hopes and dreams. So as I said, you know, the Milky Way is something that's very predictable. The moon phases are something that's very predictable. So in essence, I can look at a chart and decide that I want to take a picture six months from now, a year from now, 18 months from now, and say, this is how things are going to look. This is how things are going to line up. But as we know, weather is always something that can, that can affect that shot. Um, I've had times where I've planned a shot out at least six months in advance and booked the campsite and gone out and get there and there's fog or there's haze or there's just clouds rolling in and there you go. There's, there's your one shot, your one opportunity, and it's gone. Um, have to wait another year. Uh, this is an example of that. So I was at this area, uh, Monument Cove, some of you may know, and I was actually waiting for the Milky Way to get a bit more to the right. Um, it's coming up from the east, going west, and I was waiting for it to get a bit more 
um, straight up. And clouds started to roll in, so I had to cut that night short. Um, but a hey, spoiler, later on the slideshow, we'll see the, the shot that I actually captured the next night. Um, another thing to think about is light pollution. So the effects of city lights. Um, there is a website, and also I do have um, these papers here that I'll hand out at the end to anyone that wants one. It's kind of just a brief overview of Milky Way photography, um, kind of going into more of the technical side. And these websites will be listed, like the app and all that stuff. Um, so Dark Sky Finder allows you to look online and just see um, where are the darkest skies in North America. Um, also, preserving the night sky, something that the Acadia Night Sky Festival has done a great job of promoting um, and that Bar Harbor has done a great job of doing as well. Um, as you can see here, this is a picture that was taken um, with light pollution in the background. So in this instance, um, I actually used it as an element to my advantage. Um, so that was actually my, my dad. And so this was probably taken four or five years ago when I convinced him to come out to the night sky with me. And after that moment, he was, he was sold as well. So there's, um, I'm actually not sure if in this slideshow there's more pictures of him um, as silhouettes, but he's, he's come out plenty of times uh, since then. Um, but that light pollution right there is actually light pollution combination of uh, Bar Harbor and Ellsworth. So what we'll do now is um, we're just going to go through a portfolio of things that I've shot in Kigi National Park over the last five to six years. Um, kind of a little story behind each one. Um, throughout the, I know he had mentioned earlier that um, you know, we'll have questions at the end of the session. If you do have any questions along the way, feel free. Uh, to, you don't even have to raise your hand. Just blur it out and well, I'm, I'm happy to answer anything. So this was the first image that I took in Acadia National Park that I was actually very pleased with. Um, this was taken about five years ago. And as you can tell with the story I gave earlier about Mo Chen with being on Sand Beach and the Milky Way, I was heavily inspired by um, his work. So um, this was one of the first images that I had taken. And some of you may actually remember, um, it was actually the, oops, I didn't include that slide. It was actually the poster of, I think, the 2014 uh, Akigi Night Sky Festival. Um, here's another, um, this is actually the Fire Tower um, by Southwest Harbor. Um, this is an example of just making sure that things line up. So as you can see, there's a very small window for that Milky Way to line up with that tower. And this was definitely a shot that involved going up there in the daytime, scouting the location, checking out my composition, and then coming back, whether it was that night or weeks and weeks after. In this instance, it was coming back weeks and weeks after, and uh, spending the night um, up there, or not the night, but a decent chunk of time up there. And this actually was a, a memorable night um, because the sky was not always that clear. It was definitely one of those nights that once we'd hiked to the top, clouds rolled in, and we had to wait for about two and a half hours to get this picture. And the window that was available was probably about 15 minutes before another set rolled in. So um, although there's a lot of planning that's involved, um, there's also patience that comes into play. Um, this is the image that I showed earlier, my father uh, standing on Cadillac Mountain. Um, this is one that he's, I think he's used for like every profile picture of his, with like Facebook and Instagram, like he's, <laughs> this is his go-to. Um, this is a picture of me doing the exact same thing. Um, but this one, and actually this is a good example of where, of how light pollution can affect. So this is actually, the first shot was facing north. Um, so into Bar Harbor and Ellsworth, and this shot is facing south. So you can see the difference that light pollution plays just in, you know, these were taken the exact same spot, one facing one way, one facing the other. Um, so with my work, there, the images that I just showed right there, the previous four, those were all single composite, uh, single images. I do do some work that is composite work where I will take one image of something and then an image of another. They're always the same location. The tripod is always set. It's not pulling a sky from somewhere else. Um, it's always shot on location. But sometimes I just want to see if I can expose something to bring out a bit more detail. Um, this was actually my first and I believe my only experience with light painting. And this is the, um, I forget which one this is. This is, um, I think, um, 
this is one of the carriage trail um, bridges. And I'd had this shot in my mind for a while, but also an example that making sure that things line up. Uh, there's a very small window there, because although the Milky Way, when you look up, does not appear to be moving quickly, that's about, you'd be looking at about a 45 minute window right there where you have to get that shot. Um, so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna show the two images that went into making that. So here's the first one. <laughs> that's just strictly exposing for the Milky Way. Um, and if we didn't have any lights, that's what we saw. Um, and then we had, uh, this time I recruited the help of one of my high school friends and um, made him run in there with a headlamp. And he did some light painting on the inside and then as I light painted the walls coming out and then bringing it back all the way around, we have the composite that we had there with you know, some tweaks and um, just corrections. Um, this is another example. Um, beyond that, I kind of started to think, how can I push this? How can I start doing other compositions um, by taking many, many pictures and putting them together? For example, this was taken actually right here at the point um, one night. And the glow that you have from the right-hand side there is the sun that you get, like civil twilight, and then images throughout. And although it may not look like it, there's probably about six images that are in that picture um, that are brought out to bring out that detail and to kind of create that look. Um, here's an extreme example of that. Um, this image was taken at the top of Cadillac Mountain um, over the course of, I think, five hours or so. So got up there as the sun was setting in the west and then um, stayed for the Milky Way rising in the southeast. So that covers, I think it's about 140 degrees or so. Um, and that was an extreme example of taking many, many pictures and kind of stitching them all together to kind of create a single look. Um, here's another example of that. Um, the sun, this would be the sunrise over Otter Cliffs. And I'd gotten there probably about three hours before taking the night sky shot and then waited for the sunrise. Um, it's easier to do it the opposite, to do it, you know, you get there for the sunset, you set things up, you get your composition, you kind of know what you're going to see because you're able to see it through your camera. But if you get there when it's completely dark, you're unable to really see what your composition is going to be like uh, unless you're doing trial and error. And um, to anyone that's interested in kind of pursuing more night sky stuff, a good way to do that is to just go the highest ISO that you can do and take a picture, even if it's a 30 second exposure. Um, you're then able, it'll be super noisy and will be pretty much unusable, but you're able to see what your landscape will look like. And that's a good way to, to um, fix your composition on the fly at night. I think it's easier to get there before. Um, here's another extreme example of that where this was actually the stitch of every single image that was taken within that three hour window or so. Um, so those are the star trails that we're seeing um, as the Milky Way moves. So pretty much the, so that's pretty much where the Milky Way was, that's where it stopped. So you can kind of see that faint, the Milky Way kind of just going, you know, whatever that distance is in degrees. Um, yeah, just one of those, like it's a, it's a fun image to kind of play around with, have the ideal in your mind, and have that vision, and just go out and, and see it come, come to life. Um, this is another example of kind of doing a composite, but this one had a new element. The previous ones, um, it was more just a very far, all the elements were far away. So the focus was the same. Um, like if we go back, the focus that we have set for Otter Cliffs and the stars is going to be pretty much the same, so you don't have to refocus. Um, however, with this, there was focus stacking that was involved, so taking the pictures of the very close rocks, then those rocks, those rocks, the cliffs, and then the night sky, and kind of compiling everything together. Um, this was actually an image that was used by Canon for the, um, their night sky, their summer night sky uh, contest about three years ago or so. Here's another example of a composite, but this one's more subdued. Um, this is actually the picture of me earlier as the, the moon was setting and um, that self-portrait. Uh, this is actually what I was waiting for. So I was waiting for the, the meteors to come out. So I stayed out um, for about an hour and a half, two hours, and captured, captured these. And when you hear your camera clicking, shutter, there's nothing worse than when you hear it click off, and then you see the meteor go by, and then it clicks on, because like there's, 
percentage-wise, it's like half a percent chance that it's going to happen at that time. Um, but it happens more often than not. It seems, it, I think they're planning them out that way. Um, so, there are a few good ones, but there were a few where I was like, ah, oh, why? Um, this is just a shot from North Bubble overlooking Jordan Pond. Um, the green there, that's air glow. Um, so usually in the, in the summer, you're going to definitely pick up a, on a bit of air glow. Um, which, I mean, as to the picture, it takes away from the picture. It depends on what you're going for, I guess. Um, this is a picture of, I don't know if any of you have hiked Beehive, and as you're going along that cliff, across that tiny little bridge, um, there's always that one tree that kind of hangs way out. And so I actually stayed up there one night on that tiny little bridge. It's probably about like three feet wide. And I did a time lapse up there. And this is actually a combination of some of the pictures that I'd taken during that time lapse. Um, but to get that picture, so if any of you do beehive either this fall or next year, when you go up there, think of, so you have to pretty much hug the wall as close as you can and just stay there. Um, and yeah, it was, it was not the most comfortable night, but it was still, it was still nice. Um, this is a familiar site. This is the, um, actually the poster for 2016 for the Kiggy Night Sky Festival. Um, this was another example of at the base here. We can definitely see some of the clouds running away, but that was a night where clouds were just relentless. Um, we'd gotten the foreground shot and just thought, you know, we're going to stay out here and stay as long as we have to to get the shot. Um, and we're there for probably about four hours or so. And if any of you have spent time there in the daytime, bugs are terrible. At night, also terrible. Um, so uh, they, don't, they don't ease up. So um, that was actually a little side story. That night was actually the night where I saw the largest meteor I've ever seen. Um, so where those clouds are right now, if you pull them back, you're right about up here. Um, a meteor went through, and it just ignited just green. And it was like a flash of light that went through the sky and kind of just illuminated the, uh, the clouds. It was absolutely stunning. Uh, once again, not a moment that was captured when the shutter was rolling. So um, this, um, the picture that I showed earlier of the clouds rolling in, this is the shot that I wanted that night. Um, so I was out there, had the shot in mind, clouds rolled in. So I actually went back to work in Bangor, came back the next night um, and stayed there to take this shot. And I'm happy. Um, it all worked out. I was very pleased with it. Um, and this one was the shot that was a finalist for the uh, National Park Foundation, the Centennial. So there's a, there's a, few, a few versions of that going around online. Um, this picture here, uh, Little Hunter's Beach, this is one that is just a sole, um, just a single shot. Um, this one was featured actually most recently in May in National Geographic Traveler. If I don't know if you guys knew, but Akigi National Park was selected as a hundred of one, one of the 100 world's best destinations. Um, so they had a little magazine booklet thing that they put out for about like three months, and um, that was one of the images. So there's the. They were saying that Akigi National Park was one of the best for autumn excursions. Um, And this picture at the end here, most of the pictures that I've been going through have been featured, you know, night sky um, in the spring, in the summer, in the fall. It just goes to show that you can, although the galactic center may not be present in the winter months, um, it's still fun to get outside, view the night sky. Um, it's, it's completely, you're in complete solitude in, in winter. I mean, there's, in the summer you can find solitude in, while photographing the night sky, but in the winter you are you are completely alone. So this is taken at Eagle Lake um, with bubble in the background um, and just a little self portrait there. So um, how do we do for time here? Perfect, cool. So that's what I have. Um, I like I said, I do have a little pamphlet here that's going to go over like you know, things to look out for um, and gear and just very basic things that I didn't really want to discuss throughout my talk today. That's something that. Um, you can look over if you have any questions, contact information is on there as well. So um, with that being said, do you have any questions? Um, yes? Yes, if you could hold on a second.
Could, could you hold on a second so that everybody can hear the questions? Um, can everybody hear me? No, you have to do it this way. <laughs> oh, the Star Trail shot that you stitched. Yep. So, how long was each exposure? So that one, um, I typically stick with, just for the sake of noise. Even though with a, a Star Trail, you could typically you could really go as long as you want because you're really not worried about the stars. Be, going from being points to becoming lines. Um, but typically what I'll do is to minimize noise, I'll typically stick with about a 30 to 45 second exposure with, with those. Um, I have done single shot star trails where you kind of just have a roll for 45 minutes and you just walk away. Um, but I found that dealing with noise with that and also I, I'm the kind of guy that, as you know from my luck earlier of not catching the meteors, um, something's going to go wrong, you know, in 45 minutes. So some car is going to go by and shine its headlights, and I'm going to get like a lens flare, and 45 minutes is going to be gone. So I don't like to put all my eggs in one basket, so I'll typically go with um, smaller versions. Yep. Anyone else? Yes. Uh, earlier you mentioned that uh, if you're just scoping out a, a potential uh, show out, you throw your camera in the highest ISO, but yeah, you're, you're, the quality of the image is going to be yeah, uh, you know, it's very going to be very noisy, grainy. So uh, doing a, you know, for a real shot, what would your highest ISO sh setting um, be? For depend uh, really depending on the camera. Um, nowadays, I mean, cameras are able to go up to you know twelve thousand eight hundred and be completely fine. Um, but typically, um, I'm sticking about thirty two hundred. I find that thirty two hundred. Uh, 100 ISO and about a 30 second exposure is going to be giving me the light that I'm, I'm happy with for the exposure of the night sky. Anyone else? Can you talk a little bit about the difference between the kinds of cameras you use and maybe using uh, iPhones and some of the, yeah. the, uh, the more casual forms of photography? For sure. So when I first began, um, you know, about six years ago when I bought my first camera. It was, it was a Canon. Um, it was an entry level, just a T2i. Um, and those have a crop sensor on them. And pretty much if you're buying a crop sensor, they're not very great at handling noise. So as he was talking about earlier with ISO, you know, pushing that kind of camera to 3200 ISO or pushing the sensor set sensitivity that high, um, it's not going to yield the best results. Um, so when it came time for me to jump into this, besides the first few times I went out, I had my crop sensor. But then I decided to jump to a full frame. And I've always shot Canon. Um, I grew up in a family that always shot Canon, even with film and everything. So I kind of carried on with that one. It wasn't necessarily a, um, uh, you know, rigging reviews and saying, oh, this one's better than this one, and really weighing my options. It was more, it does the job I want it to do. And that's what I've gone with. Um, for doing something, as you would mentioned, with iPhones, I mean, this kind of stuff is, is probably not going to be possible um, with an iPhone. But um, one of the cool things is a lot of the new cameras are actually allowing you to use your iPhone to take pictures with your camera. So iPhones can still be incorporated in some way. Um, so for example, let me go back. Uh, like this shot of me. Um, I actually use my iPhone in my hand to remote into my camera. So it has like a built-in Wi-Fi. So I was able to stand there um, with my headlamp, point at myself, find the focus point, and then set a timer on my phone, put the phone in my pocket, assume the, the pose, and um, take a few shots that way. So I mean, with technology, you're kind of able to do just about anything you want at this point. Um, cameras are, as I mentioned, I mean, the turnover is crazy. I mean, there's something that's coming out every six to eight months that just makes me shake my head and say, wow, you know, just if, if only I had that, you know, when I bought mine. And, but um, to try to keep up with that kind of stuff, it's, it's, it's a headache, so I, I try to avoid it. But no, um, I have a feeling that maybe the iPhone, like, 15, yeah, you'll be able to probably do this kind of stuff. So we'll see. <laughs> Any others? Great. Why don't oh. we hold to the hold to the? Oh, you have behind okay. Come on. I, I, I know you do a lot of summit photos. Do you tend to just hike up while it's still daylight and spend the night, or? 
So for the ones that I've done, they've typically been about like one to two mile trails. So what I'll do is I'll typically hike up, stay there for, I'll usually start the hike at sunset. So when I get up there, I'm still in twilight. And then when I get to the top, I still have time to kind of check my, my composition and make sure that everything's how I want things to be. Then I'll sit there for probably you know, 30, 45 minutes, wait for night to actually come, take a few shots, and then hike back out. Um, like for the ones that I've done, like Beehive, North Bubble, um, the Fire Tower, those are all you know relatively smaller hikes. Um, but you know, as I mentioned earlier, you know from from the beginning, I was not a fan of going out at night, but you know um, at night alone. But kind of stomped that fear and been able to hike and do everything by myself. So it's been, it's been kind of cool. But the um, but actually to answer even more your question. Um, there are some areas that I still feel uncomfortable. And they're not in Acadia National Park. It's like going to Baxter State Park and doing, you know, late night hikes. Not a big fan of running into a black bear at night. So, <laughs> all right. Any, anyone else? Nope. Don't here. Uh, can let him yeah. repeat it? Sorry, got to repeat it. Sorry. Uh, have you taken any pictures where you deliberately included the moon in the picture? Um, I have. I've used the moon in times for as a way to expose a foreground. Um, for example, the I already went by it. Like that. Like I mean, I've used the the foreground as some uh, or the moon as. Um, as a way to expose the things around me. In terms of just focusing strictly on the moon, I've done that with um, when like the lunar eclipse has happened. Um, but for the most part, I haven't had much luck with capturing just solely the moon with a landscape, uh, with a foreground element. Um, even with like a telephoto lens or something like that, I typically have issues with haze and all that. So I, I've mostly stuck with Milky Way. Any others? All right. Oh, got, you got one more. Can we, let's hold to okay. the end simply because we're, yes. yep. okay. Thank you, Nate, very much. Yep. And <laughs> our next uh, guest is Jim Nicholson. He is a photographer whose work looks into the way that we as a species grapple with the unknown and our relationship to the universe, particularly as those inquiries delve into the realm of science. His presentation this, this evening is called The Art of Night, and Jim works full-time as a fine art photographer, custom digital printer, and teacher. He was a former Acadia National Park artist in residence, a program that is still going on and is uh, um, world-renowned. Uh, before committing himself to the photographic life, he pursued the classic artist career path of NASA engineer and corporate attorney. So he has a BS in aerospace engineering from the University of Texas at Austin and a JD from Harvard Law School. Jim now lives in Camden, Maine uh, with his wife and daughter. And he's here tonight to give you his presentation, The Art of Night. Please give him a welcome. Thank you very much. So. <laughs> Appreciate it, and and thanks to Cirque and, and and Katie and everybody involved in bringing us here tonight. It's very exciting to be part of this um, part of this adventure. Um, I'm going to talk and kind of mostly talk about my own work and kind of my my journey to night photography and how I've how I've come to it and 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 kind of how it's changed over time. I'm also going to try to address to the extent that some of the questions that people asked. There were a lot of great questions, and some of those I think kind of apply to some of my things too. For example, you can probably get tired of moon images because I have a lot of those, um, and um, so I'm gonna. So I'll kind of bring up some of that, but just like with Nate, um, I um, feel free to answer any or ask any questions as we're going, and um, and then we'll of course have the question and answer um, question at the end. So all the, all the photographs I'm going to show you, except for the first one, are from Acadia National Park. This first one, you'll see why. It's uh, <laughs> this is uh, age 12, and I got my first telescope, and it was a bad telescope. It was, I was so excited about it, and it was impossible for me to find anything at all. And I didn't. I mean, this is you know before internet and everything else, and 
and pretty much the only thing I could ever find with it was the moon. And so that, that may have been the beginning of my fascination with the moon, which we'll see um, as we go on, on here. But I, I was very interested in space, and it was something that was my, probably my biggest passion. And I you know, ended up going to college in aerospace engineering and working at NASA and, and doing that whole path. So it was something, and then I went away from it for a long time, and night photography has been the way I've kind of come back to that, that, that passion I had as a youth. Now, for me, I started off photography being serious about it about 10, 11 years ago, and I was doing landscape photography, and that's really what my main focus was. I, was, I liked hiking and camping, and photography was ancillary to that. And as time went on, I started going out where photography was my main purpose, not just, my, um, in, not just the side, side thing I was doing. And so, like a lot of people that are doing photography, um, the, you know, for, if you're doing landscape photography, you're very often staying out very late. You, 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 you're watching sunset. And as time went on, I started picking up little things like stars and the moon and that sort of thing in my photos. And like, for example, in this one, it may be hard to, hard to see, but there's, you know, essentially, I was shooting sunset. This is from the top of Cadillac. I was shooting sunset from, and these really amazing clouds, which is one of my, weak, my weaknesses. Is really fascinating with the clouds, and and this one star became visible in it, and it really, and you know, it, I wasn't going out to shoot night photographs, but it, but you know, things that the night was starting to creep into what I was doing. I actually ended up taking a workshop at Main Media about seven years ago, I think, where we had I hadn't done night photography yet, and I had to show my portfolio of all these landscape images, most of them at sunset. I'm more of a night person than a morning person, so there weren't a lot of sunrises, but. And you know, basically the instructor told me, it's like, you just need to stay out a little longer. You're already there. You're only, you're only 20 minutes away from night. Just stay out a little longer and, and you'll be fine. And so that's what I did. And so I started doing these sort of things where I was taking advantage of the light from the moon, for example. This is, these are clouds at night that are lit up by the moon and the ocean. And, I've, and I always just kind of loved, loved that look. And you know, these are night sky photographs, but without stars and without, without that sort of thing. It wasn't until later that I started trying to photograph the stars themselves. So these are all up, you know, basically from driving the park, the park Loop Road at night and stopping at different, different rest stops over the areas. And, and, and it's something I really, uh, this one's actually from Skudik here, um, same kind of thing. Those clouds up high are lit by a full moon. And, so you, and I, I really love this, the combination of light you get. Once you have moonlight involved, it's, you know, it's reflected sunlight, so it's actually, when the camera sees it, really, as something close to daylight looks. So when you use your camera and take a picture of the light of the full moon, very often the white balance, is what they call it, will look like it's a daytime photo. And then you'll see little visual clues like stars in the sky that make you realize that it's not actually a daytime photo. And in those kind of cases, just as a, you know, in terms of the interpretation of the photograph, you know, you, know, you as a photographer, as the artist, and what you can do, very often I make those images a little bit bluer. It's, it's very simple to do in Photoshop or Lightroom or anything else because it makes it feel more like, even though that's how it looks more to your eye and that's how, and that's how I think it often looks better, but that's not how your camera records it. So, you know, around that, you know, a year or two later, I started getting serious about trying to photograph different landscapes with the stars, much like um, Nate, Nate has done and, and a lot of other people have done. And, and so the broader project is called Nightfall. And, and a lot of it has been certainly with Acadia National Park. I live about two hours away in Camden, Rockport area. And so I'm up, you know, I come up a lot. As I've, you know, as I'm getting older, I can do those late night drives less so than I used to. <laughs> but uh, I still, you know, can stay up pretty late up here and make it home safely. So this photograph is Jordan Pond, of course, with the bubbles behind it. And so, so, you know, like a lot of people doing night photography, where I really wanted to experiment at first was making star trails, getting those long, long exposures and creating um, these images that have these lines in them that are, can be really, really dramatic. And it's, I find it very challenging to come up with aesthetically pleasing compositions using those lines. Those lines are so dominant in the composition, but they can, you know, but they, they can be very powerful and they work out well. This image, for example, it's a relatively wide-angle lens, and I, I believe that's probably a seven-minute exposure. Um, I, I usually 
in almost all cases, I actually like doing a single shot and I just don't do as long. So usually I do like a five or 10 or 15 minute exposure just with one shot with my camera and instead of doing the, the multiple shorter ones and, and combining them. I, I've done it that way too, um, but usually these are single exposures. Here's another iconic location with otter cliffs. And this is one of my longer exposures that actually came out well. This is 13 and a half minutes. You know, Nate had mentioned how sometimes things go wrong in an exposure, and um, which is absolutely true. <laughs> There's uh, whether it's weather or, or someone's headlights. Uh, in this case, actually, something wrong happened that actually ended up being right, which was in this 13 and a half minute exposure, along, sitting here in front of Otter Cliffs, it was, it was during the Night Sky Festival about five years ago, and then usually there, there was not a lot of traffic on these roads at night, but after the star party ended on top of Cadillac, where a lot of people came off, the people were driving along the road, and so three cars passed during that 13 and a half minute exposure, and the headlight just kind of brushed the, the cliffs as they were going by. And so those three, those three exposures kind of lit the cliffs up in a way that I, I hadn't thought of or wouldn't have done on my own. So sometimes you get lucky, too, and I had no idea how it was going to turn out, but... Um, I was happy, happy it happened the way it did. So I was a, one of the artists in residence here at Acadia, um, as, as Seth mentioned, um, three years ago now, um, yeah, 2014. And so this is from, this photograph is from Sundew Point. So I was actually living here on the CERC campus and able to walk out to this location. And, um, and so I, I took a lot of photographs from there. Um, you know, something that, Night photographers hate is weather and clouds, and but I, as I mentioned, clouds are something that's um, actually quite like. And so I really love when you start getting these photographs where there's lots of clouds and combined with the stars, because you, it creates that part of it is that that sense of mystery. You don't know what's going to happen, how it's going to come out in the camera. And so I really like that look, and it makes each image more unique too, because you get the conditions of the evening. Um, one aspect of that also is that because these are longer exposures, the clouds are moving. So over a five minute exposure or 10 minute exposure, the, the clouds will be shifting sometimes quite a bit. And so you get these kind of, they become even softer and more amorphous than they would be, would be otherwise. Well, actually I should also mention, um, I, I don't know if you can see on the horizon line that these two uh, kind of glowing areas in the horizon, one on the left, one on the right. When I was, shooting out there at Sundew Point. It was the bane of my existence, but every night those cruise ships would leave Bar Harbor, and you could see them for about three hours. The camera would pick it up, the light from those. So that, that's what those are, those are the cruise ships out on the ocean. And uh, I would curse them as they came out of the, <laughs> came out of the harbor there, <laughs> so. Here's another example. This is also from uh, Sundew Point. And um, Baker Island light here in Acadia is something that I've, I photographed an awful lot of, and, and this, this is what I was talking about, where I, I really love these type of images where there's really almost just traces of the stars and the trails, and it's really more about the, the, um, the overall, the, the clouds and the sky and the overall structure. You know, and again, these are images to follow up with what Nate uh, had mentioned. You know, this is where, this is, this is not true night. This is, you're starting, you're still getting twilight colors involved there, and, but a lot of times that could be really useful for creative effects. Here's another example of the Baker Island light. Now, I admit, even though I love the clouds, sometimes I also curse them too when they, when you have other plans. Um, so this this image is from actually from the top of Cadillac in the parking lot. We can see those trees, um, but it's the this glow in the, this corner is actually a crescent moon, and the, you know, the moon when it's even the crescent moon puts out so much light that it really can kind of create a really dramatic landscape. And so one of the really amazing and fun things and, and counterintuitive things about night photography is that, you know, this scene is not how it looked to your eye. It's like, it's accurate to what's out there, but the, the part of our eyes that can see in the light, see that kind of intense color, the camera picks it up. And I, it creates an interesting, I don't want to, ethical makes it sound too, too big of a deal, but you know, it's an interesting question. Like what is, what is the proper thing the photograph is it how it looked to your eye is it how it was in real life and so i think that you know and i think ultimately it's up to each individual to decide how they want it to look but this is very close to how the camera how the camera saw it so i think it's how it really was but it looked like clouds and black sky 
Black Knight to me when I was there. Um, this photograph has a couple of technical problems, but I love it because it was about five degrees. And uh, this is from the Eagle Lake parking lot and, uh, um, and with the, the, frozen, um, the frozen ice looking at the, um, the bubbles from the, the north. And this is something a little bit different just because you have, it was a longer exposure obviously, so you're actually getting the star trails and the ice was a little, was moving a little bit because it was not totally iced over. And so the reflections of the star trails were kind of shaky too, you know, because it was a long exposure. It was just kind of an interesting image. And again, um, the photograph in a night. Here's another image where um, I'm kind of using a lot of the full moon, like, like some of Nate's, um, Nate's did, where the moon's a little off screen. You know, one thing you'll find if you photograph, you know, photograph a night is things that are really bright, like a street light or the moon or anything else, can be too bright for your camera. So if you want to have detail showing on that, you can't have detail shown everywhere else. You have things silhouetted. And so very often you'll see people will essentially, you hide that thing behind something. If you're in an urban environment, you hide that street light behind the corner of a building. Or if you're in a, if you're in a, a, a natural environment like this, you kind of angle yourself so the moon's behind a tree or behind a cliff or something like that. So it's not so bright and intense. So this is uh, from Sand Beach, and this this was also a full moon, a full moon night. So the um, you don't have as many stars, but the obviously the uh, the the beach itself and the snow and the, and the rocks along the beach were very well lit by the by the moon. And so this is from Scudic Point also, and in you know, some of these, especially a wide angle shot like this one, th you know, this is not taken at the the dark, the darkest part of night. This is still taken during the, the time time frame of uh, the twilights. So you're starting to see the elements of the sun still. But when you look at it closer, you, when you have a big print or you get close to it, you'll see there's all kinds of stars up in there. So it's just one of those those things that really is surprising when you see something that could be a daylight scene or a sunset scene, and then you see all the stars. Yes, yeah, so the last one of these. This is also from uh, Sand Beach, um, and again the full moon. You can see how how much light the full moon is putting on the snow in the island. So it becomes a really dominant part of the composition. Now, all the ones I've shown you up to now have basically been star trails. But what I really love are the star points. And, and I call them star points. They're essentially when your exposure is short enough that you don't see any visible motion of the stars. And depending on what kind of lens you're using, a wide angle lens or a telephoto lens, you have to have exposures that are like, let's say between five seconds Three or five seconds and thirty seconds um, to get that. I tend to shoot a lot of telephoto, so I have to do shorter ones. So a lot of these images are three seconds, five seconds, eight seconds, that sort of thing. But you know, it's a different, it's a much different kind of feel to these sort of images. To me, they, they feel quieter, more, you know, they could be more elegant. They could be, um, you know, just it's just a different mood, and it doesn't mean one's better or worse. It's just a different kind of feel. But this is where I've kind of found myself uh, attracted to. This is Bubble Pond. And so this also is a good example. That, you know, I've come to Acadia many times, and these, this photo and the next two are all from basically the same location and much different scenes. So a scene here with the Milky Way. This is where there's a full moon, where if you didn't see those little white dots in the sky and the reflections here in the foreground, it, would, it could look like something that was, you know, a daytime photograph, just because that light of the full moon is so close to uh, the normal daylight. Oh, and it's, um, and so this is my Baker Island light, very often photographed by me. Um, and again, th th this is kind of one of my examples of the, the kind of the stillness of the image. And, and I think that the stars as points really lends itself to that. So that's, if that's something you're looking for, it's something that, um, you have to use these shorter exposures. And just so I can men mention very quickly on this, to get these shorter exposures, the trade-off is you have to go to higher ISO. So very often you have to go to a higher ISO than you would for a star trail. So you might be compromised in terms of, of noise. This is from Scudic Point as well, and there's three of those cruise ships out there under the Milky Way. So. And, and this, is a, this is that bigger island light too, just <laughs> hiding over there. So. And so this is from uh, 
from Raven's Nest. And I had to look this up because I couldn't remember, but this is from during my residency. Again, figure out light. And then the three brightest stars are Antares and, and L2 are not stars, it's Mars and Saturn. Because they were, I'd, I'd, seen on, I'd seen somewhere that they were going to be basically lined up that night. And so um, that's, that's what I did. So this is also from uh, Skudik Point, and probably another example of how a lot of times my night sky, sky images are excuses to photograph really amazing clouds. This thing was giant. I mean, this is a really wide angle. Um, One last one, and then, oh. And so I was very lucky in, when I, I was here for 19 days as part of the residency, and during that time frame, I finally, after many, many failed attempts, was able to photograph the Northern Lights. And so there was, a, there was an Aurora alert, and I went out there, and um, I went to the top of Cadillac. I didn't want to risk anything. I wanted to get as a broader view as I could get. And, uh, and so, and, and uh, I had two cameras set up, and I was, I was all in, but I was finally successful with it. And um, so these are pretty narrow views with a longer lens, like a hundred millimeter lens or longer. And so, uh, and I, I was trying to get the stars as points with this too, but it was really amazing. Now, I, I um, this goes to what I was talking about earlier, where um, the um, to to the you know, to your eye, this was not a um, you could see the northern lights moving. You could see the aurora and the motion of it, but it was not this colorful to the naked eye. The camera picks up more of these colors than we see. And so I think a lot of people, will be, including myself, are so used to seeing these dramatic images of the aurora that it almost people are almost a little disappointed when they see the real thing because it's not as intensely colored as it is in all the pictures you see of it. But that being said, it's still pretty amazing. So around the same time frame, I started working on longer-term projects. And my first project, my first long-term project is something I call Adventures in Celestial Mechanics. So I mentioned before that my undergrad was aerospace engineering. And this is actually one of my textbooks from, from college. And it was such a wonderful name. I was finally, I was very excited to find a, a place for it and stole that name for the name of my project. But this, with this project, what I'm doing is basically photographing the full moon from different places in Maine. And because the full moon, if you want to watch the moon rise, it's going to rise in the east. Your best eastern views in Maine are going to be over the ocean in most cases, unobstructed views. So I've, I've worked basically mostly up and down the coast trying to photograph the full moon, sometimes with landscape, sometimes without, sometimes with clouds. This is actually from Scudic Point. Um, not that you could tell from the image, you know, but it's a, um, it was a full moon that I photographed from up here. This is from Acadia as well, of course, and we're actually kind of looking out at, at Skudik um, with this one. You know, for me, a big part of this project is I do a lot of research about the different names that different cultures have for the moon. Like, for example, this is the Hunger Moon, which the Algonquin tribes used as the name for the February moon, because that was the time of year when the food stores were low and it's early enough that you weren't able to get, you know, game was lean and or unavailable. And so, of course, um, hunger was the prevalence theme that time of year. This is the milk moon, which is a May full moon. This is from the top of Acadia. This is actually one of those times, sometimes you get lucky. I was trying to photograph the full moon rise from the top of Cadillac, and this fog rolled in. I couldn't see anything at all. And so I, was, I just started driving down a mountain, hoping to get below the, below the, the fog and the clouds. And I did. It was like halfway down the mountain. I, the moon just was giant. You know, it, it seemed so giant, and it was right there. And so I got lucky on that one. This is the uh, Trapper's Moon. And one thing that was really amazing, I, I have never seen this before or since, but you'll see that there's um, basically like a beam of light below and above the moon there. It's called a, a moon column. It's actually refracted light. There's ice crystals in the upper atmosphere refracting the light. And, I, and so you get these kind of, basically that beam of light, it takes a certain combination of humidity and temperature and everything else to get that. So this is from Scudic Point as well. I was lucky enough that my 19 day residency covered a full moon. So uh, <laughs> I photographed pretty much every full moon in the past, past five years. 
Now, some of these, I know this is a night sky, um, night sky weekend and stuff. So some of these are, the ones you're gonna see coming up are um, a little bit less uh, the night sky, because actually, as I've been photographing this series, I've actually been much more attracted to these full moon photographs that are much lighter and more subtle and, and more pastel. And the way you get those is, you know, the full moon is a moment. Like it's, you know, they'll say the full moon is on Tuesday, September 19th, but really it's, it's at a certain time. And if you photograph the full moon the night before the, that, that moment, then usually the moon rises earlier compared to sunset. Not usually, it always does. It rises, and so you can often get more daylight colors if you're photographing it the day before the full moon. And the night after the full moon is when you get those really dark, dark nights. And so that's just one of those, those things. But I really um, have been kind of moving towards these. And I, and I know these are not necessarily projecting well, you know, but um, these are so bright and, and subtle. But these, um, and that one you probably, oh, you can see it. Okay. So it's, I, I'm, I'm intentionally making these very subtle and or try to, trying to seek out scenes that are very subtle like that. And it's really just photographing the night before the full moon. That, that gives you that opportunity. And of course it depends on the conditions of the day and that sort of thing. For those of you who don't know, um, one reason the light's so much different in all these is full moon happens roughly the time of sunset. Full, the rise of full moon happens roughly the time of sunset. And it matters a lot whether you're a half hour before sunset or half hour after sunset. And so that's where you get all these really disparate lighting conditions because it just all depends on where everything is lined up that day. This was another one that was very, um, this from, from the top of Cadillac also, and the, the moon, you know, you know what time it's going to rise, and for 45 minutes I couldn't see anything at all, and finally it started breaking through the clouds. And it was really just one of those kind of special nights, partially because it was so frustrating before that not to see anything. And this, of course, is the lunar eclipse, and I, I, I was able, after three failed attempts of that, where the clouds didn't help out, I was finally able to, to capture this photograph here in Acadia about, it was the last one, so it was September of two years ago, I believe, um, was when that was. Okay, the, the last project I want to talk about is what I call Harmony of the Spheres. And the Harmony of the Spheres project is something that is, it's my newest project, you see I just started it last year, and it's much different than what you've just seen in a lot of ways. But you know, the inspiration behind it is this idea that's often called music of the spheres, harmony of the spheres. But for 1,500 years, the prevalent idea about how the universe worked and the world worked was the Earth was the center of the universe. And all the heavenly bodies, the visible planets, the sun and the moon, rotated around the Earth in a series of, of spheres, these celestial spheres. And, and these celestial spheres made this universal music that controlled everything. It controlled natural processes, you know, how music works, um, the, the human soul, like the music soothes the savage, savage beast. That's a reference to this. And so I've always, you know, from a scientific point of view, you know, about 500 years ago, people figured out this was not actually the way the world worked. But some ideas are just really poetic and wonderful. And, and even though it's wrong, I still some, it's still something I, I find just to be a really beautiful idea, a really inspiring idea of how the world works. And so I used, I was, what I've done with these images is these are all using photographs of the night sky, and I'm essentially using different methods to abstract them. So I'm taking photographs of the night sky with my camera and using Photoshop and other tools like that, creating these compositions that to me are referencing the musicality and, and just the, the wonder of the, the way these celestial bodies move. And and you'll see, you know, these are, for me, it's been, a, it was really hard for me to do this project in the sense of to get over all my uh, preconceived ideas about what a photograph should be. This is really kind of challenging the idea of what, you know, are the, you know, are these still photographs? And different people come up with different answers. But just to give you, you know, I anticipate some of the questions, the way I'm creating these things in short is I'm basically combining images together. So this is something where, I've photographed star trails that are going straight by looking in the appropriate direction for that. And then another scene where I've photographed stars as points and 
basically stack them together in Photoshop to kind of create these things. So it's very, it's a very um, unusual way of photographing that sky, but it's something that I'm very excited about. And these first ones that I worked on are all, you know, black and white images. And as I've, um, I keep on experimenting with these, and I'm kind of moving more towards um, trying to add these with color as well. And, and it's the same kind of thing. Where these are composites of night sky images. A lot of them, a lot of the images I'm using for this are from my my times in Acadia National Park. One last one. This one I have to admit I cheated on a little bit in the sense of that's actually a photograph of the sun that I'd taken, <laughs> and then and then interposed it with um, photographs of the night sky. And so that's it. So um, thank you again for your, your time. Do you guys have any questions? <laughs> well, thank you. Can you talk a little bit about aperture and how you deal with that? You just is it strictly yeah. for depth of field, or you can't really meter anything out there, right? Yeah. So you know, it's. In terms of figuring out what your appropriate exposure is, of course, there's a lot of trial and error with that and doing the high ISO test shots and, and that sort of thing. For aperture, I usually, so for people who don't know what this is, what he's talking about, you know, aperture is basically how big the hole is of what, of, that, that the light is going to hit your sensor on your camera. And so if you have what's called, you know, it gets really confusing, but if, you know, if, if you have something where you are what's called wide open with the aperture. You're getting a lot of light into the camera, but you're getting a really thin amount of stuff that's in focus. So you might see, so, so, and if you, if you want to have everything in focus from front to back, then you have something, you're not letting very much light into the camera. So you have that trade-off that you're working with. And there's different approaches to doing that. You know, one approach, and, and Nate kind of alluded to this with his, is you could take multiple pictures at different focus points and using the computer, stitching together. And if for me, the type of thing that I shoot, like all the moon images, let's say, um, or other things like that, or just the star trails, they, they don't need a depth of field because I'm only taking photographs of things that are far away. I don't have a lot of foreground to infinity type of shots. And that's just my own personal style. But you know, that's the, that's the big challenge. And I think with night photography, if you want to have that kind of shot that's going to go from the rock that's here, six feet in front of you, to having the stars, to have that all in focus, you're almost certainly going to have to do multiple shots and bring them together. Um, or you could do it with one shot as long as you want to have star trails, <laughs> because the amount of light you're letting in the camera is going to necessitate that you can't do the stars as points. You're going to have to do that. You know, and that's, the stars as points, I, should, I didn't mention this, but the Milky Way is one of those things where you're basically having to shoot those as stars as points because once if you start getting motion of the Milky Way, usually, you know, there's exceptions, but usually that's not a good look. That's not the look you're looking for, at least. And so it's the same kind of ideas for all, all his shots. So, so, so yes, yeah, so for me, I'm usually like my moon images, for example, tend to be like an f5.6 or something like that. They're not anything extreme on that, but but that's a lot of it's because just the, the type of things that I'm shooting. Any other questions? All right. Um, well, I would like to thank the main media workshops for bringing you two guys out here this evening. Uh, let's give both Nate and Jim a big round of applause. Any, any other questions? Uh, we'll get Nate back up here as well. Any questions at all? Oh. If you don't want to be in the microphone and want to ask a question, you just come by later. Afterwards. Yeah, you can come down and talk to them uh, individually. So um, thanks again for coming out tonight to the Scudic Institute. Please have a safe drive home. And don't watch the night sky while you're driving. Take care and thank you.